to those who have joined us on social media, we greet you in the name of Jesus and welcome you. Uh, you know, this morning we just are going to look into Ephesians chapter 6. Ephesians chapter 6, we are continuing from where we left last week. It's part of our series or our team for this season, putting on the armor of God. And if you have been following my messages, this is part 7. Part 7 is also the final uh, message on this theme, putting on the armor of God. What a significant number, 7. 7 means resting in the Lord. Right, and this was, we started this 7 weeks ago, about 7 weeks ago, in conjunction with the prayer shield for pastors 2022. I thought I can do it in four weeks, but the Holy Spirit had different plans, right? So we are in our seventh week, and next week we will start a new new series or a new team as the Holy Spirit leads. Now, today I want to look at Ephesians chapter 6, verses 18 to 20. Verses 18 to 20, talking about supernatural provision. Remember, we're talking about the armor of God. And God has blessed us. This is the final armor with a supernatural provision, which is prayer. For some of us, the word prayer itself is like a bitter pill. I was so bitter, cannot swallow. It's prayer. Now let's look at verse 18. Ephesians chapter 6, verse 18. I'm just going to do from 18 to 20, and I'm going to expound on it. With every prayer and request, pray at all times in the spirit. And with, with this in view, be alert with all perseverance and every request for all the saints. Verse 19. And pray in my behalf that speech may be given to me in the opening of my mouth to make known with boldness the mystery of the gospel. Verse 20, for which I am an ambassador in chains, that in proclaiming it I may speak boldly as I ought to speak. Amen. My friends, when you talk about the armor, as we have been talking the last six, seven weeks, we talk who puts on the armor? The soldier. So we talk of ourselves as being the Christian soldier. The Christian soldier. So the supernatural provision for a Christian soldier is prayer. Are you following me? That's our supernatural provision. That's what's going to help us overcome. That's what's going to help us win this war. A constant, not just one time prayer. Some of us go to prayer, we pray eight hours after that for the rest of the year, we don't pray. But I'm talking about prayer that will give us perseverance. And that kind of prayer is a constant spirit of prayer. Not super religiously kneeling down and putting your hands like this and kneeling down and in one corner for two, three hours. No, but constantly throughout the day, praying in, to glorify God, praying to thank Him when you're driving, when you're eating, when you're, you are in constant communication with God. There is a time for personal devotion and there is a time for fellowshipping with God. The soldier, I want you to imagine the soldier, we're talking about this, this armor this last six weeks. A soldier at war is, is, is who enters the conflict area or enters conflict is fully dressed and armed. Correct? He is fully dressed and armed. And, 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 and But something else is important, something else is essential to the soldier. Great confidence. If there is no confidence, the soldier is dead even before he enters the battlefield. He needs to have great confidence. He needs to have assurance. He needs to have courage. And these three things, confidence, assurance, 
And courage comes with prayer, nothing else. So, when you talk about a prayer and a Christian soldier, I want you to note a few things this morning. Firstly, the soldier must pray. Turn to somebody and say, you must pray. The soldier must pray. The soldier must pray. The soldier who is not always praying is not assured of God's protection. The Christian soldier must pray all the time to maintain a constant unbroken conscience, consciousness, consciousness of God's presence and God's care. If I'm not in prayer, I do not have that with me. Such infuses the needed assurance only through prayer you get the assurance, only through prayer you get the confidence, only through prayer you get courage. Some of us say we don't have time to pray, how sad. If you do not have time to pray, let me tell you this, then you do not have the assurance, you do not have the confidence, and you do not have the courage to battle for the Lord and with the Lord. Matthew 7 verse 7 to 10 is my scripture reference. I'm going to just highlight a few things on this scripture. Matthew chapter 7 verses 7 to 10. This is what scripture says. Ask and it will be given to you. Seek and you will find. Knock and it will be opened to you. For everyone who asks receives and the one who seeks finds. And to the one who knocks, it will be open. This is a sample of a persevering prayer. To persevere, to keep on knocking. To keep on knocking until it is opened. To keep on asking until it is received. Persevering prayer is asking, seeking and knocking. Three things. You just don't ask, 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 ask. No, you ask, you knock. Sorry, you ask, you seek, and you knock. Until you receive an answer, until the thing that you're seeking for is found, until that door is opened, you keep on praying. It is being so obsessed with getting something. That means you will not let go until you get it. Are you all following me? It's like a small, it's like a spoil, not small, like a spoil child in a shopping center. I'm sure all of us have experienced this when you walk in shopping center. Suddenly you'll see the game shop or a toy shop. Now these children don't want the toy shop anymore. They want game shop. Right? And if he doesn't get what he wants, have you seen the children stamping their feet and bringing the whole roof of the shopping center down? That's what you and I should be doing with our prayer life. We should be asking, seeking and knocking until we get it. Are you all following me? Stamp your feet, roll on the ground. That's what they do children, right? I'm sure you have seen it, right? As long as you don't experience it, it's okay. But you have seen it, it's alright. <laughs> it's good. It is never giving up until God gives you a response. Until God says, maybe God is saying, wait. Maybe God is saying, no, not this time. Maybe God is saying, okay. It's granted. Until you hear a response, you don't stop. The words ask, seek and knock are in the present tense in the scripture. It doesn't say you must ask. That's not future. It says ask, present, present tense. A person is to keep asking, is to keep seeking, is to keep knocking. He is to persist in prayer. Some of us say, Pastor, please pray for me, Pastor. 
and I am sleeping pastor. That's the pastor's job to pray. Who told you? It's the job of a Christian to pray. The pastor prays with you. The pastor prays for you. But there's come a time when the pastor will tell you to pray and he stands with you in agreement. We have to teach our people to pray. We have to teach our children to pray. They cannot remain in nursery class when it comes to prayer. There is no such thing as a one line prayer because prayer is communication. The words receive, you know you ask, knock, you ask, seek and knock and you receive. The words receive, find and open, right? Receive, find and open are also in the present tense in verse 8 of Matthew 7. So this shows that the answer to prayer is more than just a promise. It's more than a promise for the future. The person who perseveres in prayer possesses the answer now. Not tomorrow, now. Perhaps the thing has not yet happened. But by faith, we as believers, we know that God has heard our prayer. You know, sometimes we are praying and praying and praying and the thing is not coming, but we are praying. And then we come to a place where we say, Okay, right time to stop asking. You know what? Your spirit man has received the answer already. You got to move on. Because if, if that promise is going to come immediately, or whether it's going to come two months' time, or two years' time, your spirit man has already received the answer. God has heard your prayer. So I want to remind you, maybe the things have not happened yet, but by faith, you and I as believers of Jesus Christ, when we pray, we know that God has heard our prayers. You and I should know that. Christ taught us several important lessons about prayer. Right? Firstly, true prayer is persevering prayer, not praying one day and then next day tell I give up. No, and then, and then we come to this very nice conclusion. I think God doesn't want me to have it. No, Pastor. That's it, La Pastor. God doesn't want me to have it. Let's change plans. God expects our prayers, all our prayers to be persevering prayers. Persevering, to persevere, to, 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 to push and push and push until something happens. When we sense a real need to pray, we not only ask, but we seek and we knock. We do not play around and murmur a ghibli prayer. This is not Flintstones and Mickey Mouse and Donald Duck. This is the kingdom of God. So we pray. And when we pray, we really pray. Amen. When we pray, we really pray. Because that's where the answer is. Number two, prayer is to be often. Like I said earlier, not pray today. In the next seven days, I forget how to pray. Because Christ commanded prayer. He pointedly said, ask, seek and knock. And as I pointed out earlier, Christ demanded that we pray often and we pray with intensity, intense prayer. The answers, third one is this, on that one verse, I'm still on that, 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 that first verse. The answer to our prayers are assured. You find that in Matthew 7 verse 9 to 10 as I read just now. That is the answer. And answers for prayers is assured. Not by me. By God. It's assured by God. God is not... I want you to understand something. God is not reluctant to give. He is not sitting back. 
You know, like sometimes when you go and see your bosses in your offices, they will sit back on their big chair, they'll sit back, while talking to you, they'll sit back, look at you and they'll say, you know, I'm busy. We will discuss this some other time. They're not interested. God is not sitting back disinterested. God is not sitting back unconcerned about our welfare. Many all apart from Pastor Kenny, all of us are and the children and the youth, right? The, 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 the married couples, or most of us are married and we are parents. And, and, and we know how concerned we get or how interested we get when it comes to the welfare of our children. How much more is God going to be concerned and interested? Think about it. He's our heavenly father. He's a loving father. He is a God who loves and cares. No matter what. No matter how low you have gone. No matter how you have disappointed Him. He loves you and cares for you. He will not re refuse the request of His dear child. It is how you align yourself to that promise and that blessing. I know when we were growing up, I'm sure we do it. We do it sometimes with our children too. Okay, if you want this blessing, you got to do this. You achieve this, we will, we will do it. A promise always comes with a criteria. A promise always comes with a requirement. For a promise to be delivered. God will not mock our request. If you go and ask God, I want a Porsche, God is not going to laugh at you and say, look at yourself first in the mirror and see whether you can drive a Porsche. God is not going to be wicked like that. Are you following me? He will not mock your request. He does not give grudgingly. James chapter 1 verse 5 tells us that God does not give us grudgingly. He does not even hesitate to give. There are many times in, in our lives that we have seen where we don't even have to ask and it's given. When we walk in faith, there are times there's no money to buy provision. Provision is provided. The larder and the cabinets are empty. Suddenly it's full of things. That's provision. He does not hesitate to give. And what he gives is not of less quality than what an earthly father gives. That means he's a higher quality when God gives. God does not give ragged substitutes. God doesn't give you something that is not of quality. That's why in Proverbs 10 22, what the scriptures say in Proverbs 10 22, the blessing of the Lord makes me rich and he has no sorrow to it. He gives exactly, or He will give you exactly what you need, or He will give you something even better than what you ask for. The thing that we must be, or the thing that we have to work on is to be in God's will. You see, answered prayer is based upon whether we are asking according to the will of God. If you are not asking according to the will of God, it's not going to happen. It must not be asked from a selfish desire and motive. Lord, my neighbor is been everything for the last eight months. Now, Lord, what you must do, Lord, you must bring down this structure and put up a bigger building and a bigger mansion for me, Lord. A house with 24 rooms and 34 icons. That is selfish prayer. That is prayer of vengeance. It will not happen. If it's happened, it's on your own strength. And when things happen in your own strength, just like Humpty Dumpty sat on a wall and Humpty Dumpty had a great fall, you will sit on a mansion and you will also have a great fall. I don't know why today I'm going through nursery rhymes, sir. <laughs> True prayer, my friends, true prayer. Persevering prayer 
acknowledges our dependence upon God. When you pray, that means you are telling God, I depend on you. I can't do it on my own. When we are genuinely in need, we come to God, we ask, seek and knock. This has been the experience of all believers time and time again. All the miracles that take place did not take place because of something else that you and I did. Look at all our testimonies that we have shared so far. All the testimonies that we have shared require us to do one thing. And what was that? To pray, to ask, to seek and to knock. It didn't just fall from the sky. My friends, the very fact that we are asking, seeking and knocking demonstrates to us something. It demonstrates that we are truly dependent upon God. If you are following me, shout a hallelujah. Remember, we are his children and he is our father. Christ said that true prayer is a prayer that really means business. It is sincere, it is genuine, genuine in its request, sincere in its request, and it keeps on asking and asking until God answers. But there is more to prayer than just asking. A person asks, he seeks, and he knocks. And the door of heaven. When you knock at the door and you keep on knocking at the door of heaven until God grants the request. Don't when the door is open, you're still knocking. There's no impact. Not two things. Seeking contains the idea that we seek to meet the request ourselves. This is especially true if the request can be met by human effort. There certainly is no idea of sluggishness to be compl com complacent in the tone of our seek and knock. The trust, you know the trust? The trust, the action, the trust is action. That means you do something to get it. Your attitude should be to get it to attitude or to get to it attitude. Yes, yes, I'm going to pray. Wait like tonight. When tonight comes, maybe tomorrow morning. When tomorrow morning comes, maybe tomorrow night. Lah. You're not busy. You get to it right now. When the Holy Spirit drops this idea or this causes a stirring in your spirit man to start praying, you start praying immediately. You don't wait. And find it knocking. Knocking contains two ideas. First, we approach every door that we can until the right door opens. You keep knocking and you keep knocking and you keep knocking. We certainly would not pound and pound away at the same door. Are you all following me? If you ask one way, it doesn't work, you ask another way. Keep on knocking. We certainly would not pound and pound at the same door. We must move about knocking until the right door is open. Secondly, we must continue knocking at the door of heaven. We must wrestle with God. I'm not talking about WWF huh? or whatever term they use today. Our time was WWF. We must wrestle with God. Don't give Him rest until He opens the door. Such action shows dependency upon him. And coming to him in fellowship and in communion and in communication, communicating with the Lord is bound to please him. Is bound to please him. Just as such communication pleases an earthly father. My friends, God answers our prayers not based on how we ask or what we ask is based on our relationship. That's why we need to pray.
That's my first point on prayer. The second thing that needs to be noted about the soldier's prayer is that he must pray in the spirit. That means in the Holy Spirit, the spirit of the only living and true God. Paul re-emphasizes this in these three verses of Ephesians 6. Pray in the spirit. If you can't pray in the spirit, start praying for God to give you the baptism of the Holy Spirit. I want each one of us, those who cannot speak in tongues, to start asking God for the gift of speaking in tongues. Because that is what it means by praying in the Spirit. Prayer to any other God, or to one's own thoughts, or to some other man-made God, is empty and useless. Because when you and I pray in the Spirit, we pray according to the will of the Spirit. It's a heavenly language, the enemy can't understand it. Romans chapter 8, I'm giving you a scripture reference. Romans chapter 8 verses 26 to 27. It says, now in the same way, the Spirit also helps our weakness. For we do not know what to pray for as we should. But the Spirit Himself intercedes for us with groanings too deep for words. And he who searches the heart knows what the mind of the Spirit is. Because he intercedes for the saints according to the will of God. Here we see the necessity of the Spirit's intercession for us. We need the Spirit's intercession because of our infirmities. Remember, we all fall short of the glory of God. That's why we need the Spirit of God. That's why we need the Holy Spirit. This is reference to our weakness. Infirmities, I mean, it's, it's referring to our weaknesses in our mortal bodies that we experience even though our soul is saved. There are many weaknesses in our natural bodies that continues to burden us as we await for our glorification. One of the most troubling weaknesses for a Christian, however, is our ineptness in prayer. This is the specific weakness that is in view in this morning's text. As the verse 26 part B explains our infirmities. We know not what we should pray for as we are. That means we do not know what to pray for. This is not a matter of style. It's not a matter of, of manner. But of content. The contents of your prayer. We've been given a basic outline for prayer by Jesus in Matthew 6 and Luke 11. Right, the Lord's Prayer. And, 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 and this model prayer instructs us on the kind of things for which we should be praying. If you look at the, the prayer of our Father, that's a model prayer. We should pray for God's name to be regarded as holy. For God's righteousness or righteous kingdom to come and to be established. For God's will to be done on earth as it is in heaven. Those who pray the Lord's Prayer will pray this prayer over and over again, but they do not want anything to be established. Your kingdom come, your will be done. God says don't do it, that's when they go and do it. How is God's kingdom going to be established? As it is in heaven. Do you think heaven is like this? Do you think heaven is like the, take the most richest man in this, in this, in this township? Go and see what he does and if you think heaven is like that, I'm telling you, you've got a wrong view of heaven. The problem is that we don't know how to pray this way in our specific circumstances. So should I pray for this sickness to be healed? Or should I pray to show God's glory? Or for the grace to endure the sickness in order to show God's glory? What should I pray for? Who's going to tell me? The Holy Spirit. 
This is our primary weakness in prayer. We don't know God's will. And this is why we need the intercessory work of the Holy Spirit. This is why you and I need to pray in the Spirit. Because the Spirit will lead us. And since He is God, He knows God's will. Hello? The Holy Spirit is God. And He knows God's will. Just like Jesus said, I do only the things I see my Father doing. He knows the will of the Father. So since the Holy Spirit is God, He knows God's will and is able to make intercession for us according to God's will. He's, willing to, he's able to intercede even when we do not know what the will is. Because when you are praying in tongues, you are praying according to His will. He is directing you to prayer. I believe there is encouragement in this passage. Remember, I'm not here to condemn you. I'm here to realign our pattern to kingdom patterns. The Apostle Paul, when I say this passage is a passage of encouragement, because Apostle Paul includes himself as one who shares our weakness in prayer. He didn't say, accept for me. I'm the great apostle, you know. He didn't say that. He said, we. That means including himself. He calls it our infirmities and says that we know not what we should pray for as we are. He includes himself in every situation of the weakness. My friends, misery loves company. There's comfort in knowing that we are not alone in our struggles in prayer. There are days when you feel like praying, there are days you don't feel like praying. But when you have got a partner, when you have got a team, when you have got a Holy Spirit, you will overcome those issues, those weaknesses. Even the great Apostle Paul struggled in this area. Right? In, in 2 Corinthians chapter 12, 2 Corinthians chapter 12 verse 7 to 9, Paul describes an unanswered prayer for relief from a thorn in the flesh. 2 Corinthians chapter 12 verse 7 to 9 this is what he says and lest I should be exalted above measure through the abundance of the revelations there was given to me a thorn in the flesh the messenger of Satan to buffet me lest I should be exalted above measure for this thing I besought the Lord thrice that it might depart from me and he said unto me, My grace is sufficient for thee. Amen. For my strength is made perfect in weakness. Most gladly, therefore, will I rather glory in my infirmities than the power of Christ may, that the power of Christ may rest upon me. So the apostle Paul didn't get the answer he wanted. He wanted this stone of flesh to be removed, to be gone. But God said, My grace is sufficient for you. So you can endure with that thorn around. You can still overcome. Right? So in the same manner, we often don't know what God's will is in our specific situations. All of us go through times and periods of challenges. There's no denial to that. All of us go through it. But this is the reason why we need the intercession of the Holy Spirit. This is why we need the Holy Spirit to help us, to intercede for us. So this brings us to the question, how does the Spirit intercede for us? How does the Spirit intercede for us? Now, the answer to this important question, we see that scripture tells us the Spirit Helpeth our infirmities. Then after describing our weakness in prayer, the apostle explains how the Spirit helps us in prayer. He maketh intercession for us with groanings which cannot be uttered. I read that scripture just now. Here we are told that we are not alone in our prayers. The Spirit of God is with us. 
He is within us. Not only we have the second person of the Trinity, Jesus Christ, at the right hand of the Father making intercessions for us. Hello, everybody knows that. Jesus is sitting at the right hand of the Father, interceding for us day and night. We also have the third person of the Trinity, which is the Holy Spirit. Making intercessions for us. That is why praying in the Spirit is so important. We have two intercessors. When we pray, wow, a double weapon. Can you all understand what I'm saying? If you're going into a gun war, you know those cowboys you see, they walk the side. And then they turn around and shoot. Can you imagine you've got two guns? The guy drawing out one gun, you got two guns here. I got Jesus and the Holy Spirit. Devil is dead. Some of you are looking not happy. But that's the way it is. That's the war. The battle is real. Thank you, Lord. Two intercessors. Are you going to listen to this? I know I'm taking some time today, but I need to because this is important. Two intercessors. One with the Father interceding for you and for me, and one in us interceding for us. Jesus Christ interceding to the Father, the Holy Spirit that's in us interceding for us. You all don't look happy. This is what makes us great in battle. This is what makes us overcome battles. This is a privilege to the Christian soldier. But how does the Spirit of God make intercession for us? The Bible says that it is with groaning that cannot be uttered. These are unspoken groanings that cannot be uttered. Now, now, I, I want to tell you this. I, I, I don't see this as uh, uh, meaning literal groans. Then when you say groaning, so everybody starts groaning to the Lord. But I don't see this as literal groans. But it's a metaphorical groan. As we see in verse, uh, uh, in that same scripture, which refers to the groaning of creation and the redeemed. Scripture says, God knoweth the mind of the spirit, the unarticulated, not the groans of the spirit. So what does all this mean? What am I trying to tell you? I believe it means that while we pray audibly, oftentimes, ignorantly, we are just babbling what we want to blabber. The Spirit is making intercessions for us inaudibly without words. In other words, the Spirit translates for us by praying for us what we should be praying. So whatever you are babbling here, when you pray in tongues in the Spirit of God, the Spirit now is telling God exactly what you should be praying. So although you are shooting off target, the Spirit is making it go on target. Hallelujah. Amen. What's the result of this intercession? The answer provides good news. The good news is that God knows the mind of the spirit and therefore God understands his unspoken groanings. God understands the unspoken groanings. Those unspoken groanings of the spirit are intercessions for us according to the will of God. You know, in 1 Samuel chapter 16 verse 8, 1 Samuel chapter 16 verse 8, the Lord said to Samuel, Men look at on the outward appearance, but the Lord look at on the heart. This God who looks on the heart knows the mind of the spirit. What is the mind of the Spirit? The mind of the Spirit always makes intercession on behalf of the saints according to the will of God. The Spirit, or the point I'm trying to make is that since the Spirit intercedes in accordance to God's will, His prayers are always answered. Correct? 
when we pray according to the will of God, our prayers are answered. Although our spoken prayers are not always answered, the unspoken intercession of the Spirit, of the Spirit which accompanies our prayers is always answered. That means when you pray and then you break into tongues, and then you come back and pray again in understanding and then you break into tongues, the Spirit is telling God what He wants to hear. God's will is never thwarted by our weakness in prayer. There is great encouragement. And I hope you are encouraged this morning. God's will is going to be fulfilled in our life despite our weaknesses in prayer. Amen. Even if we are weak, when we pray in tongues, we have the Spirit is going to lead us to the will of God. Amen. So we pray to the best of our ability according to the will of God. But even when we don't pray correctly, we can take comfort in the fact that God's will is being accomplished through our prayers by the accompanying intercession of the Holy Spirit. That means the Holy Spirit is like a mother hen. The chicks are doing something wrong, but the mother hen is always controlling, always correcting. Not correcting you, but telling the correcting to God. Look at our God. Even when we say the wrong prayer, he wants to hear it or he hears it correctly to favor you. Think about it. The third thing that needs to be noted based on Ephesians chapter 6. Remember I'm talking about the soldier's prayer. The third thing that needs to be noted about soldier's prayer is that he must be sleepless in prayer. Some of us when we pray we start sleeping. Hallelujah. Pastor I cannot sleep. Start praying sister. She sleeps. Right? Now, we must be sleepless in prayer. Sometimes so intensely. That means we, we are fighting that war. Hello, please don't go and take a sword now and walk around the streets. I'm not asking you to do that. I'm talking about spiritual warfare. Continuously praying. Intensely involved in prayer. That you go without sleeping in order to pray. If you have walked that deep journey with the Lord, you would have experienced this where you are starting to even pray in tongues or mention things in your sleep. That is praying sleeplessly. And some of us think that we are going to get tired the next day. No, when you pray sleeplessly, the anointing is so powerful that you don't get tired. You actually refresh the next morning. Those of you who have done midnight prayers will know. Overnight prayers, not midnight prayers. Overnight prayers. So what I'm saying, keep watching and praying. So that you do not come into temptation. This is what Jesus said. Keep watch. Remember he left the disciples and he went a little further. And he told the three, his inner circle. Keep watching and praying so that you do not come into temptation. And then when he comes and finds them sleeping, he says what? The spirit is within but the flesh is weak. In confronting death, Christ stood alone, neglected by his closest friends. He was alone. Now what was I saying? He arose, he went to the tree who was supposed to be praying with him. They were asleep. The companionship, the spirit of prayer and comfort that he had sought was not there. All were asleep. Sariana Tuko. Sleeping. Tamil is improving, huh? Yeah. All were asleep. He had left alone. He was left alone, or he had been left alone to wrestle with God by himself. Now, secondly, Christ warned of temptation. The disciples had failed to pray for him. But they must not fail to pray for themselves. Christ said, watch and pray. Both are important. Watching and praying. Watchfulness sees and praying prepares. It's only when you watch you can see. And it's only when you pray you can prepare. They were both to watch in order to see temptation coming. And they were to pray in order to be prepared when temptation struck. But both these things never took place. 
Number three, Christ was born of the flesh in its weakness. They were sleeping because of the emotional strain and distress. Their master was now going to be arrested. They thought that their world was coming to an end. Children, when one of your parents is sick, you go through sudden distress because you do not know the, the, the future, what the future holds, what's going to happen. That's what the disciples went through. So, as Luke says in Luke 22 verse 45, that they slept because of sorrow, that means sadness. They were deeply saddened. The evening had been shocking and taxing. They were weary, fatigued and preoccupied. Concentration in prayer was difficult. The disciples probably fought to stay awake and to pray with their Lord or for their Lord. But the importance of prayer, the, the, the dependency upon God in facing trials had not been learned. They were making two mistakes which are common among all believers even today. The, fail, the, the failure to watch and pray. The disciples, when I said the two mistakes, they were depending upon their own wisdom and strength instead of God's spirit to fight whatever battles they are in. That was the first mistake. They depended on their own strength. And today we find the same thing among Christian soldiers. Sometimes we try to find ways in our own strength to overcome problems. Number two, the disciples were taking God's deliverance for granted instead of assuring his deliverance to the testimony of prayer. That means they took the testimony of prayer for granted. That's why they didn't pray. They said, I can do better. Maybe if I sleep and get up, you know, things will change. Jesus will be king of Jerusalem, king of Israel. They were failing to stay awake to pray, to watch and to be watchful in prayer. The spirit was not alive. Their spirits were not alive. Their spirits were not alert to overcome the flesh. In application, I want to say this. No believer is ever alone. None of us are alone. Remember that. Even when you are physically alone, you are not alone. Even if your closest friends neglect you, the spirit of prayer and comfort, through spirit, the, through the spirit of prayer and comfort, God is with us. Amen. You know, Jesus said, if two or three are gathered in my name, I'm always there. Are you all following me? Two or three. Right? I and the Holy Spirit, two. Jesus is there. Three. Two or three in my name. I am there. So even if you are alone, Jesus is there. Many trials arise immediately and unexpectedly. When Pastor Mara had that fall and fractured her hand, it was unexpected. We didn't plan. Hello? We didn't plan. Right? And most of the major sicknesses and, and diseases that we see people experience, it happens all over sudden. It's not expected. The only thing that we expect is, what is expectancy? We expect a child for nine months. You expect a child. When you expect there's deliverance. But when there's no expectation, it's dangerous. Right? Many times trials just rise up in front of us. And only persistent, sleepless prayer will prepare us for such a crisis. Remember, the flesh struggles against the spirit. There is a constant war. Nice rain, nice to sleep. Why must now must have prayer meeting? Now when I sleep a little while and get up later. This one, uh, go worship and boring. Lah. Pastor is boring, his voice is not good. Lah. 
His voice is like Elvis, like cannot. We want Michael Jackson's voice. You are not here to see the pastor. You are here to praise and worship God. Let me go on. The fourth thing, I'm going to finish soon. Huh? I'm going to finish soon. So just bear with me. The fourth thing that needs to be noted about a soldier's prayer is he must pray unselfishly. Huh? The soldier is not in battle alone. Many are engaged in the same warfare. The outcome of the battle is determined by the welfare of all that are involved. For example, we pray for this nation. Now we are going into elections, we are praying for this nation. But if I go and pray now, Lord, please help my party win because they will give me a big government project. You are not going to get it. That is not. That is a selfish prayer because you want to get the government project. You want to go and vote for that party. But if you pray, Lord, put the people that you have pre-appointed, predestined to sit at that place so that this country can be governed in righteousness and in justice. That's not an answer to this prayer. So that the people will benefit. So that the people will start to see the glorification of your people, the church. That's an unselfish prayer. Remember, the soldier in battle is not alone. Sorry, the soldier is not in battle alone. Many are engaged in the same warfare. So the outcome of the battle is determined by the warfare of all involved. God is going to answer of the common thing that's going to benefit the kingdom. The Christian soldier must pray for those who fight with him. Not just me. I don't care about the next guy. Lord, give me, give me, give me. Don't worry about him, he's okay. The Christian soldier must pray as much as intensely for his fellow soldiers as for himself. As I pray for myself, I pray for my little brother. As I pray for myself, I pray for my sister's death. As I pray for myself, I pray for our children. As I pray for myself, I pray for the youths. Not just for myself. In fact, if you look at Paul, he's asking the people to pray for him. He never asked God for anything. He said, I just thank my God. I thank my God. I thank my God. I thank my God for the handcuffs. I thank my God for the chains. Ephesians 1 verse 15 to 16. For this reason I too, having heard of the faith in the Lord Jesus which exists among you, and your love for the saints, do not cease giving thanks for you, while making mention of you in my prayers. Paul is praying for the people constantly. The fifth thing, this is the final thing, that needs to be noted about a soldier's prayer, is that he must pray for leaders in particular. Praying for your leaders. Not just the leaders of the country, the leaders of the church. Leaders, their decisions and examples. You know, the way, the lifestyle of a leader often determines the outcome of the battle. The Christian soldier has leaders who teach and preach and administer throughout the church and around the world. Boldness and decisiveness and purity are needed to put the enemy to flight and to capture souls for the gospel. You know in 1 Thessalonians 5.25, one of the shortest verses, if you want to, 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 to memorize the verse, this is one of the ways. 1 Thessalonians chapter 5 verse 25 says, Brothers and sisters, pray for us. Who said I can't memorize scripture? Who said you cannot memorize scripture? What does 1 Thessalonians 5.25 say? Say it with me. Brothers and sisters, pray for us. Pray for your ministers. Remember, note this. Paul does not say please. Please pray for us. He did not say Will you, if you will pray for me? No. It's a charge that he's giving. He says, brothers, pray for us. He's charging you and me. All believers must pray for their ministers. 
Paul says us, not me. He says pray for us. All of God's chosen ministers are to be prayed for by believers. We must not omit a single minister. And the idea is that we must pray often. Not just every day, but often every day. Right? That means in a day, a few times, often. What an impact would be made upon the world if we obeyed this one charge, if you pray for your leaders. My friends, my dear family here, we bring this series on putting in the armor of God, putting on the armor of God to an end. And I want you to remember that we need our armor on. We need to be pursuing holiness, pursuing holiness, living in the word, devoting ourselves to prayer. So my final message is, let's watch and pray. Let's watch and pray. Amen. Let's pray. Can you please stand with me? Gracious Father, we acknowledge this morning our great need for your mercy and for your grace. When we examine our lives, maybe there are 90% of us, maybe 95% of us this morning would have to say that we need to refresh or we need a refresh in our prayer lives. We need a renewed devotion and commitment to prayer. Maybe even more than the discipline, we need a fresh awareness of our absolute weakness and dependence on you. We are reminded this morning, Lord, of what you said in John 15. In John 15, Jesus says, without me you can do nothing. So Father, to whatever degree our efforts in ministry are without success, the root of that probably lies in our neglect of prayer. To whatever degree we are struggling with sin and not living in holiness, to that degree the failure is in prayer. Father, how much do we miss out because we haven't sought your face? So this morning, please forgive us. Please forgive us and change us and give us a fresh love for you, Lord. Amen. A renewed devotion to you only expressed in prayer. Help us, Lord, in this moment to examine ourselves, to turn from any sin, to repent of those things that we have done, which we should not have done, to turn away from our neglect, our slothfulness in spiritual disciplines, and to renew our devotion. Lord, forgive us and refresh us. Help us and give us the strength to devote ourselves totally to you, Lord. We pray, Lord, that this week you will meet us in this moment, that you will draw near to us as we draw near to you. That we would resist the evil one and that, that the evil one will flee away. Give us the strength and the grace and the help in time of need as we come to your throne of grace. We pray this in Jesus' mighty name. Amen. Amen. Please have a seat. For those on social media, we thank you for joining us. We will see you next week.